It is a cool, early December evening, and Walt Disney is standing on the soundstage at the Disney Studio lot in Burbank, California. A few weeks ago, he celebrated his 47th birthday, and now he's watching as a present that he gifted himself, that he helped make with his own hands, is about to be tested. The journey to this moment has taken several years and started just after the war. Following the animator strike seven years ago, Ward Kimball grew to be one of the few animators left that was in any way close to Walt Disney. Near the end of World War II, in 1945, Kimball completed a full-scale railroad at his house. He named it the Grizzly Flats Railroad. Ward invited his boss over for the Steam Up, a party for the inaugural running of the locomotive on 900 feet of track laid around Kimball's house. To his credit, Walt attended the party and was entranced. Ward let Walt run the engine, and from that moment, he was hooked. He'd always loved trains, ever since he was a boy. When Walt was a child back in Marceline, Missouri, his uncle, Mike Martin, worked as an engineer on the railroad. Whenever he stopped in town, Uncle Mike visited the Disney farm, bringing a bag of candy for Walt and his little sister. He would sit with the children and tell them stories of the railroad. Later, when Walt was 15, he spent a summer working as a butcher on another railroad, not chopping up meat, but selling food, drink, print media, and tobacco to the passengers. As an adult, seeing Kimball's, Walt wanted his own railroad, his own train. It's December 1948, and Walt already has several trains. This latest one, a 1 12th scale steam engine, is being stoked, the fire in its box crackling. Despite being set up at the moment on the studio soundstage, Walt doesn't have anywhere to keep this newest train, something he learned over a year ago. He spent the summer of 1947 on what his family called his Burma Trail after a famous World War II supply line. On an impulse, according to his family, Walt decided to spend his days that summer clearing a path around the perimeter of his home on Woking Way. Though he told no one of his intent, it seems Walt was testing an idea much as he tested others before and after. It appears he was seeing if he could fit his own train onto his lawn. After clearing the path, however, he must have realized he didn't have enough room. Walt took a break from clearing his trail in June to travel with his family across the Northeast United States and on to Goderick, Ontario, Canada, the town where his grandfather arrived from Ireland and where his father had been born. Walt visited the old family farm, the ruins of his great-grandfather's cabin, and the cemetery where his family was buried. This trip through nostalgia stuck with Walt. Around the same time, he began collecting miniatures. Walt's doctor told him to get a hobby, and so he did. In addition to his fascination with trains, Disney collected bits of historic Americana, though he was meticulous in making sure that the products were extremely detailed. At this point, however, there wasn't much to do with these miniatures. The following October, Walt was called to testify before Congress about communism. As one of the friendly Hollywood witnesses called by the House Un-American Activities Committee, Walt testified that the animator strike of 1941 had been a communist plot to take over the Disney studio, and that the League of Women Voters had been involved. Regardless of the veracity of the first assertion, this last fact about the League of Women Voters was certainly incorrect, and Walt would later apologize. Never very political, the strike and post-war communist scare in Hollywood drove Walt into the arms of more impassioned, more extreme individuals. Some of those fellow Hollywood anti-communists were racists and anti-Semites, and Walt would bear the stain of suspicion of sympathetic views and the stain of association with these extremists for the rest of his life. Senator McCarthy would continue his witch hunt, but Walt would largely stay out of politics after the hearing. One year ago, for Christmas, Walt sent three of his grandnephews Lionel electric train sets. 
He also bought a few of the miniature trains for himself as a combination birthday and Christmas present. Back in his office, he enlisted one of the studio's machinists, Roger Broggy, to help him build an entire miniature landscape for the trains. Walt's office consisted of two rooms, one with his desk and a small conference room attached. It was here that Walt and Broggy started building their model train setup. The eventual result was a display larger than most cars, in the era of land yachts nonetheless. Towns dotted the rolling hills, with two trains running through tunnels, stations, switches, and raising bridges. The creation was impressive, but for Walt it was just another test. When they'd finished, he asked Broggy, now what's for real? The answer to that question would come in the following months, when Ward Kimball invited fellow animator Ollie Johnston up to Walt's office to have a look at the boss's new toy. While there, Johnston told Walt about a 1 12th scale steam locomotive he was having built for his yard. Intrigued, Walt visited the machine shop in Santa Monica where Johnston's engine was being built. Now, Walt has his own 1 12th scale steam locomotive. And with a small gathering of fellow train enthusiasts, Walt is waiting on the steam to build in the engine. The electric train in his office across the studio, that was easy. No one yet knows if this boiler, the result of months of work, will even hold pressure. It could explode, sending shrapnel flying throughout the soundstage. As the pressure builds, everyone goes quiet, listening for the sound of straining metal. Back in the spring, Disney mentioned an idea to studio executive Harry Tittle. Walt wanted to put a train ride from the lot across from the studio on Riverside Drive into the studio proper as a tour. The idea was vague, but would include taking guests through special themed areas designed to put them in the Disney films, such as the Dwarves' Cottage from Snow White or Dumbo's Circus. Meanwhile, Walt had the head of the studio machine shop, Richard Dick Jones, put out feelers in the railroad enthusiast community for buying a miniature steam train and railway. Around the same time, Walt met two other railroad enthusiasts with trains on their lawns, Dick Jackson and William Casey Jones. Both of them let him run their trains when he visited. Okay, so the names can get a bit confusing here, so here goes. Dick Jackson doesn't come back much in this story, but both Joneses do. So from here forward, we'll be referring to the head of the machine shop as Richard and the train enthusiast friend as Casey, and hopefully that'll keep some of the confusion down. In June, a year after his excursion to clear a path around his yard, Walt Disney bought a larger lot for a new house on Carrollwood Drive. It will take almost two years before the house is completed and the family can move in, but at last, Disney will have the space for his train. Later that summer, he took a trip with his younger daughter Sharon, now 11, to a fair of miniature locomotives in Lomita, California. Afterwards, they visited the Golden Gate International Exposition. It was here that Walt saw a prototype for a miniature Central Pacific 173 engine. On his return, Walt had Richard Jones and draftsman Eddie Sargent make blueprints for a model of the Central Pacific 173. He had Roger Broggy, who made the miniature in his office, start work on the train cars. With these three guys from the machine shop, Walt started making his scale train, learning how to use the machines and tools himself. For hours, almost every day, sometimes on his own and on weekends, he worked in the machine shop at the studio, making the miniature parts. Everywhere he went that summer and fall, he carried a box of wheels for the train, filing them smooth at home, at work, on vacation in Palm Springs, wherever he had a moment. Tonight, Sergeant, Broggy, and Richard Jones are all present for the test. For the past six months, they have not only helped build Walt's train, but also been Walt's instructors as he learned to make these pieces himself. They've followed his exacting standard of detail, just as the animators did back in the day. 
and they've taught him how to work to that same standard. It may be Walt's train, but they are all its creators. While work on the train progressed, Walt took a trip in late August with Ward Kimball. Before he left, he asked his friend Casey Jones to try and find a scale locomotive engine, if the price was good, for his railroad on the lot across from the studio, the train that would give the studio tours. Walt departed California on the Super Chief from Pasadena. The president of the Santa Fe Railroad invited Walt and Ward to ride in the engine, blowing the whistle. Kimball noted how happy the experience made Walt. The object of Walton Ward's trip was the Chicago Railroad Fair. When they arrived, the host, the president of the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, took them backstage for a pageant of historic engines. Walt was allowed to run several and appeared in the show. Afterwards, roaming the fair, Walton Ward saw different lands that the fair featured, special exhibits funded by different railroad companies. One replicated a square in New Orleans' French Quarter. Another imitated a generic national park with a geyser erupting every quarter hour. One exhibit was a dude ranch. Santa Fe, the same company whose train Walt got to blow the whistle on during the trip here, had a Native American village. While on the trip, Walt and Ward bonded even more than they already had over their passion for trains. Walt regaled Kimball with his life story, punctuated on the way to and from the fair with visits to places of Walt's childhood and adolescence. Disney's behavior struck Kimball as nostalgic, quote, preoccupied with his own history. Before they returned to LA, the pair stopped at Henry Ford's Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, at least Walt's second visit. Back in the soundstage, the engine lets out its first chuff, the group gives a small cheer. The boiler holds its pressure. Now, the real test, seeing whether the engine can run under its own power, can begin. But the test won't just see if the engine can run. It'll see if the engine can carry the train of miniature carriages behind it. Walt gives Eddie Sargent the nod. After returning from his Chicago trip in August, Walt drafted a memo to studio production designer Dick Kelsey, outlining his plans for an amusement park called Mickey Mouse Park. Inspired by the Railroad Fair, Greenfield Village, and Eden Springs Park in Michigan, another location Walt and Ward visited on their trip, the park will be located on the empty lot on Riverside Drive, which Walt has been trying for years to figure out how to use. Mickey Mouse Park as Walt described it in the memo, would have a main village complete with stores selling Disney merchandise, a railroad station at the north end, and a town hall, home to the administrative buildings, at the other. In between would be a firehouse and police station, park health and security offices respectively. The village would also have an opera house cum theater for showing cartoons and live shows, and also a restaurant. The park would also have an old farm, a western village, a Native American village, and a carnival midway area complete with its own carousel. A riverboat would paddle around a lake, and the train would loop the park before entering the studio for the tour. For all of Walt's enthusiasm for the park, there was no money to fund it. The studio struggled after the war, and hadn't released a feature-length animation since Bambi flopped six years ago. Instead, they made cartoon anthologies like Make Mine Music and Melody Time. They turned their live-action arm, once producing instructional films for the government, to making nature documentaries called True Life Adventures. Two years ago, the studio released Song of the South, a hybrid of live-action and animation. None of these have made much of a profit, if any at all. In October, Less than two months after drafting the memo to Dick Kelsey about the park, Walt wrote an executive at the Santa Fe Railroad. They'd been communicating about his plans for the past month, but Walt said, quote, that I have been so involved in production matters since I got back that I haven't given any further thought to my project. Last month, the studio released So Dear to My Heart, another hybrid of live action and animation, also a sort of spiritual sequel to Song of the South. 
With its setting and story, Song of the South was controversial even before its release, and went on to receive mixed reactions from both critics and audiences. So Dear to My Heart, on the other hand, was set in a Midwestern history closer to Walt's own roots, and got a much more positive response. Over the next three years, it will net $1.2 million over its budget. And now, a little before Christmas in 1948, Walt is watching the culmination of all his hard work on his train. The hours spent in the machine shop, visiting railroad fairs and filing wheels has all been for this moment. With 300 feet of track laid out on the studio soundstage, draftsman Eddie Sargent straddles the tender. The locomotive chugs, gaining speed, steam and smoke bellow as Eddie takes the throttle up and up. He takes a corner too fast, wobbles, and falls off the tender, pulling the whole engine off the track. Walt, instead of being angry, is overjoyed. The train works. He arranges for another test in a few weeks, just before New Year's. New York Times film critic Bosley Crowther visits the studio around this time. He writes that Walt is, quote, wholly, almost weirdly, concerned with the building of a miniature railroad engine and a string of cars in the workshop of the studio. All of his zest for invention, for creating fantasies, seemed to be going into this plaything. I came away feeling sad. What Crowther didn't know was that Walt had much bigger dreams in mind than a simple toy train, even if he couldn't afford them yet. Work on Disney's dreams was merely delayed by a production slate revived from its post-war funk. In addition to releasing So Dear to My Heart, the studio spends the next year working on The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, Alice in Wonderland, its first live-action feature, Treasure Island, and of course, Cinderella. That's only the features. There's also the animated shorts and the nature documentaries. And in the summer of 1950, Disney will dip its toes into television. For a while, Walt's Park will go back on the shelf while he explores other ideas. It will be May of 1950, a year and a half after the first test run of the train, before the Disney family finally moves into the new house on Carrollwood Drive. The house features a soda fountain, which Walt runs himself, making yummy or disgusting concoctions depending on your perspective. After they move in, Walt begins having the train and track moved from the studio to his yard. It'll be November before it's finished, and in time for a third birthday in a row, Walt has a new train set up to gift himself. He christens the engine the Lily Bell, after his wife Lillian, and names the project the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. Walt will run the train for visitors and at parties until a five-year-old girl is injured while a guest is operating the train. Afterwards, he puts it in storage, never to run again. But while the track is being laid in his yard and while the train is being assembled, Walt begins work on his next project. In the shed behind the new house, Walt is working on something completely different which will forever change the name of his dream park. Thank you. 